Hello, my dirty friends. <laughs> it's one of those days when I'm thinking a lot about the words and um, the word litter. Okay. Litter has come to have all these negative connotations, uh, you know, garbage associations. And I got beef with that because the origin of the word litter, the noun, is um, a bed, also a bed-like vehicle carried on men's shoulders from Anglo-French litter for portable bed. And, you know, I like the way that sounds. I like the way that feels. And then the verb version of litter, you know, to provide with bedding, that's, that's one. And then meaning to bring forth or give birth to animals <laughs> or, or humans. And that verb uh, also came to express to strew with objects um, or to scatter in a disorderly way. Again, not a bad thing. So I'm not really sure how, uh, how we came to associate um, probably the disorderly bit um, is how we came to associate the throwing, the illegal throwing of one's garbage <laughs> around to have anything to do with uh, the litter that I, um, I, I, want, I want us all to be thinking about today, which is plant litter, the best and really only true kind of litter, the nourishing kind of litter. And I'm really excited about today's podcast because I had the great fortune of speaking with Dr. Francesca Cotrufo. Dr. Cotrufo is a professor and she is also the associate head in the Department of Soil and Crop Sciences and the senior scientist at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab at Colorado State University. Her background is in both ecology and soils, soils later, as you'll hear. And her work has been a big, just a big find for me years ago. I, I came across one of her papers and I have been following her work ever since because I feel like, at least for me, it was a way of putting my own thoughts in order around why it can be so challenging to navigate the different results that we tend to see and study. If you just look at the literature around soil organic matter and farming practices and what leads to what. So I'm really excited to share this uh, podcast with those of you out there who um, are uh, recovering scientists like me or just very, very much geeking out over um, all the things. So without further delay, Delay. Um, I'm very excited to share with you this interview with Dr. Francesca Cotrufo, and I hope you enjoy that. And before we get to that, a word from Jesse and our sponsors. Today's episode of the No-Till Market Garden Podcast is brought to you by Certified Naturally Grown. At the heart of sustainable ag is the belief that soil health and thriving ecosystems grow the very best food. Certified Naturally Grown is a grassroots certification program that recognizes direct market farmers using holistic methods and shows your customers that the products you bring to market are grown to the highest ecological standards. If you're looking for an affordable certification option that focuses on the thriving of local farms and foodways, you're going to want to check out CNG. Their peer-to-peer -peer inspections create opportunities for farmers to connect, exchange knowledge, and build regional support between growers, certify your produce, flowers, livestock, apiary, aquaponics, or mushroom operation today. Find out more at cngfarming.org. That's cngfarming.org. Today's episode is also brought to you by Farmer's Friend. In a world where the threat of food insecurity is quickly becoming the new norm, Farmer's Friend exists to equip, educate, and inspire growers to change the world through regenerative agriculture. Small farms are the future, and the future is now. If you need quality tools and supplies for your vegetable or flower operation, check out their growing selection of innovative and affordable tunnels, tools, tarps, and much more. Here at my home farm, we rely heavily on Farmer's Friend for our production. We have three of their caterpillar tunnels. We use the silage tarps for occultation. Their row covers have gotten us through hard winters. And of course, the quick cut greens harvester has sped up our baby greens harvest tremendously. Visit farmersfriend.com slash no-till today. That's farmersfriend.com slash no-till. 
or visit the link in the show notes and get free shipping on your entire order. All right, enjoy the show. Dr. Catrufo, thank you so much for joining me today. It's really exciting to meet you. Sure, it's really a pleasure to be here with you guys. I would um, I would love for you to just tell the tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, about how you, um, what inspired you to you know study what you study, and also what what is exciting to you right now about the work that you're currently doing? Yeah, that's actually maybe a bit of a long story. I'm a, an ecologist. I am a terrestrial ecosystem ecologist. I did my PhD in England in the early 90s. And at the time, we were worried about the increase uh, of atmospheric CO2 and how that would affect terrestrial ecosystems. Um, and so I started working actually in forest ecosystem to understand how they responded to um, elevated CO2 and in particularly how um, the soil would respond to uh, different plant inputs and more plant inputs. Um, and then I became more and more interested. You know, I first started actually studying the residues and the residue decomposition. Now that transformed into soil organic matter. Uh, and at first, uh, at the time, we would study litter residue uh, decomposition in litter bags and we would only measure the mass loss, like the decomposition was a process of loss. It wasn't a process of formation. And I got really frustrated about that because it's one of the most important process in the carbon cycle. Um, again, the process that forms sort of organic matter, and instead, litter decomposition was mostly meant to uh, the mineralization of organic matter um, and the production of CO2 from that. And I've almost always been a carbon person. It's only more recently um, that I've become more and more excited, actually, between the connection of carbon and nitrogen, carbon and nitrogen, and starting to uh, you know, everything worked together. So as we look at the carbon cycle and, and store carbon in soil, we also need to think how we mineralize the nitrogen for uptake. And, and so anyway, I was studying this process as litter decomposition. And then I said, okay, now I want to look into the soil and see what happened of plant material once they uh, decompose and uh, how do they form soil. So I've never actually been trained as a soil scientist or an ag scientist, um, uh, uh, but I was so excited about these processes that I, I taught myself uh, some, some soil science and I started working on soil organic matter um, and learned the, uh, the fractionation processes and everything. And so that's how I got into the soil and started working in soil, a little bit system agnostic. I was more interested in the processes and I was more interested in understanding how all the changes that were happening in the world from elevated CO2, changing precipitation, changing temperature were affecting those basic processes. And, um, and, and, and so at some point, you know, I started uh, putting all these ideas together and came with the MAMS framework that have received a lot of attention. Again, thinking of, okay, if plant material decompose faster in a few years time, does it also mean that they contribute less to soil organic matter, or maybe if it's important, the efficiency of that transformation, not just the time in which plant material get transformed so that, um, uh, you know, you can form more uh, on the longer term. I don't know if I can make a comparison of where my studies were going. You know, you can imagine somebody um, that, 
eats very slowly and so the food in front of them remain there for a long time but then if they metabolize very and th that long time is still the two hours that the meal can take and in the sense of little decomposition is the year of two that little decomposition can take maybe 10 if it's a very slow process where the climate is not favorable but eventually it will be eaten by the microbe and so so the problem is not just how long the microbes will take to process the plant material, but the efficiency of their processing. And so going back to my to, uh, to, to my comparison, if a person take a long time to eat and the food in front of them stays for long, but then once they eat it, they have a very fast metabolism and they burn it all out, there won't be much mass remaining. Whereas if they, they eat very quickly, but then they have a slow metabolism, then they would accumulate biomass in their own body and their, their carbon that was in the food will stay in their bodies for a longer period of time. See what I mean? And so I started moving the discussion from the time of little decomposition to the efficiency of the decomposition and, uh, and the fate of that carbon and how long it would stay in the environment. And so my studies together with several others um, have really created what we said a paradigm shift in our understanding. And so anyway, along the way of this theoretical work, I've always been very much of a basic scientist uh, then, you know, these processes became really key to, on one hand, the people studying uh, carbon sequestration and carbon markets and all, and all that side of the story, as well as the, the people that were studying regenerative ag and how can we recreate soil. And so, you know, in a way, I bloomed as a scientist that was doing their geeky research with, you know, very high quality projects, but with relatively lower public interest uh, to having a program that now also has, because I'm still very attached to my, my science, but now my program also has this very broad impacts and I'm very, very proud of them. And so I started working more and more in ag. And the other thing I want to say is that the fact that I worked from forest ecosystem to grasslands, uh, I worked from the Arctic to the tropics have really given me an idea of how soils may work, uh, how soils should work. And so now that I work in ag soils and I see how different they are, I'm, I'm, I'm have, I have more of a perspective of what can be their end goal. Uh, and I know difference with a lot of other scientists that have only worked in ag and, and, and so they don't really have a comparison to how the soils could really be. I think that's such a critical point that you make. And I, I feel like it's one of the one of the ways that I found your work was that you and I wonder if you think it's because you you came from outside of the sort of traditional agricultural soils science, you know, that that was a very stable um, pedagogy for a while where, you know, the the literature wasn't really keeping pace with what was happening in, in the ecological literature, at least at, but for me. And one of the things that really appealed to me about, especially some of the earlier papers that I found, was this sort of process focus that you have and trying to understand the underlying processes that actually explain the differences that we see in the studies that show very different results. Um, it shouldn't be a surprise that in different systems you see different pathways for soil formation and different fractionation efficiencies. Um, and the MEMS framework was one of the first papers that I actually discovered of yours, and it it just... It was like a breath, breath of fresh air. Um, would you mind um, actually uh, describing the MEMS framework? You just did a very nice job of encapsulating that, but maybe um, the acronym and then also where you think that's going. Yeah, and so the MEM stands for uh, Microbial Efficiency Matrix Stabilization. 
Uh, and so at the time, and let's put that in perspective, this paper came in 2013. So there are 10 years of, of research. And actually now, you know, some people are saying you should write a retrospective. I would, I would write this slightly different. There are a few things that uh, I'm, uh, I'm excited about uh, having discovered differently. I love proving myself wrong. It's As the best. scientists should, right? That's great. That's how we get more excited about more work. So let's put this way. At the time, again, I was focusing on, I was starting from the liter decomposition uh, field. I was frustrated with only measuring mass loss and saying that liter that decomposed faster, that carbon was lost and nobody asked lost to where. Right. <laughs> um, and so I started thinking, okay, and we did some previous work and stuff to demonstrate that not all of the carbon that is lost quickly from litter is actually mineralized to CO2 in the atmosphere, but a lot, a lot is lost through leaching. Imagine your teeth, the first thing that comes out of a litter, the first grain, you have organics that are lost, and those are very highly uh, palatable for microbes and can be assimilated, they don't require enzymes to be breaking down because they're very easy small molecules that are soluble in water and so they immediately access a microbe and so my thinking was uh, microbes can actually access and, and uh, use more efficiently low molecular weight compounds which are supposed to be labile and they spend more energy in breaking down and consuming the bigger uh, molecular structure like LinkedIn and others that uh, you know we told of them has what would persist for longer period of time. And, and don't forget that, that the framework came right after uh, the Smith and Howe paper that was the first to demonstrate the unification didn't occur anymore. And so it, was, it wasn't just me. There were several uh, lines of evidence that um, permanence was not a matter of recalcitrance, but permanence was a matter of, uh, of chemical stabilization on minerals. Mm -hmm. And so what I put together was if, if long-term persistence comes from chemical stabilization of minerals, if the, if the molecule stabilized on minerals are low molecular weights and are mostly of microbial origin, and if microbes use more efficiently the lapis component of plant material that are this low molecular weight compound, um, you know, maybe we should worry more about, first of all, the efficiency of transformation of plant material by the microbe. And secondly, and so this is the microbial efficiency. And secondly, the capacity of the soil to stabilize those microbial necromas and low molecular weight and compound on their minerals. And that is where the microbial efficiency mineral stabilization came about. Um, but I am, and, and then the following reason, and so th this, this paper really received a lot, um, a lot of attention. Um, and maybe the, 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 the thing I would, um, I, my following literature um, has then um, also put in the context is that the structural component of plant material are also important. Uh, and so while this microbial efficiency, this, this mineral, uh, uh, this formation of what we now call the mineral associated organic matter is mostly initiated by soluble or labile plant components, the structural plant component, all the fibers in the plant, um, are now, I believe, are also important. Um, uh, and they generate a different type of organic matter, which we call particulate organic matter. Um, and that particulate organic matter um, uh, is important because 
promote soil structure, promote aggregation, um, might absorb more water, uh, and also uh, what we actually don't quite know yet is which of those is most responsible for the nitrogen recycle. Mm-hmm. Because again, going back to what I was saying yesterday, uh, what I was saying, <laughs> it seems like a long time ago that we have been thinking <laughs> it's been so interesting, this conversation. Um, yeah, what I've been saying at your first question um, about um, uh, the, the fact that we need to connect not just the carbon sequestration, but also the other function in the soil. We need to think about um, not just what leads to more persistent carbon, but what makes the soil healthier, retain more water, maintain an active biology so that we can have the recycling of the nutrients with another important um, function, very important function of soil. Um, and so uh, my, you know, from the MEMS framework, I then proposed the two pathway. A model of soil formation uh, where, uh, again, we maintain the idea, the labile component. And I now have added to the microbial um, um, efficiency also the fact that some of these labile compounds can directly absorb of minerals. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is also the research that others did um, uh, and demonstrated that they are actually um, in vivo and ex vivo pathway to what we call the mineral uh, associated organic matter formation. And so again, going back to that T that is produced from uh, either um, uh, uh, litter when a rain comes and you have those um, small molecules that are, uh, you know, amino acids, carbon acids, they're really small molecules. Those can be also directly, if they find the silt and clay on their way, um, they can directly bond to them. And after bonding, uh, they could stay there for a long time but they can also exchange. And that is one of the biggest knowledge gap we have today. Mm -hmm. We don't quite understand uh, of this bonding, um, how much of the organic matter that is bonded to mineral stay for a long time and how much exchange. There is a lot of research going on to try and partition that and also to understand how much the exchange of this organic of this mineral associated organic matter actually contribute to fertility. Mm-hmm. And so I don't want You know, there is a lot of people in the carbon markets in particular that want me to say the mineral associated organic matter is the most persistent part and is is, is one and we have to focus on them and put a different price on them and just focus on sequestering them. And I I think that's a wrong and an easy approximation. Uh, The mineral associated organic matter is still very uh, heterogeneous. There is some of it that exchange, some of it that it might be stable. And that's actually, in my opinion, one of the key knowledge gaps we have to address to understand both its effect on fertility as well as importance for carbon stabilization. But going back to the um, uh, to the structural component of plant material. Imagine your lignin, imagine your fibers. Um, uh, those microbes need enzyme to decompose them. And so, um, particularly if it's cold, if it's a lack of oxygen in the soil, and so if these structure are protected in aggregates, microbes decompose them very slowly. Mm-hmm. And so they are also important. And that component of the, of the soil organic matter um, is the one that has been preferentially eroded. Uh, in agricultural soil. So if I have to say, what's the biggest difference between an agricultural soil and a natural soil, I would say is the proportion of organic matter in the particulate fraction. And there are several reasons to that. That is the, the the, the, the lower inputs 
Um, another is the disturbance, the eye disturbance. This is not protected and so it's decomposed. Um, and, and so while now people neglect that fraction, actually to me is one of the indicator of soil health and is an indicator of, um, and is one of the fraction that we should try to increase in, uh, in croplands. And I'm sorry if I diverged yes. from I, your original question with no, my line of thoughts. No, it's great. I really, one of the things I, I really wanted to talk about was that, you know, I, I do feel like, especially in agricultural soil science, we often forget that there's an architecture to function and that structure <laughs> structure and function go together and that that um, particulate organic matter and and those I, I in the forest at least I always like to talk about the persistence of you know the um, the coniferous, needles or oak leaves that have a longer persistence in the soil and how those play a very critical role it you know structurally and functionally so i'm i'm excited to talk about those things and i think that one of the one of the primary goals at least for me in speaking with you is to try to get into um get away from this conversation about the or this myopic focus on carbon which i think is very important. I, I I am not undermining it. It's it's critical piece, and not just the climate crisis, and also our agricultural soils. But that if we just focus on carbon, we will we will miss an opportunity to really understand how to gain resilience and function in our agricultural soils and and make them more persistent through time. So. Um, Saying that, I would like to actually get into um, some of the some of the more agriculturally focused um, sort of implications of your work. And you know, the literature is all over the place in terms of what um, tillage regimes and soil dis disturbance regimes in agriculture can mean for for soil organic matter. And some studies will show that you know some tillage can actually accelerate the formation of soil organic matter. Even even some of your papers have have pointed to those differences, and your recent work on the differentiation between the mineral associated organic matter and the particulate organ organic matter. This is where it starts to get very interesting to me. So, would you speak to that a little bit and how we can start to interpret some of what we are seeing in you know both conservation tillage or no tillage, and and what do you think we should really be framing our um, framing our study on when we look at how we manage our soils in an agroecosystem? I think we should be thinking at the system. And it's never one thing. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, natural soils are disturbed. There are animals that, you know, there's cabbage across them and there are earthworms and there are all kind of, of things that move the soil up and down. Um, and so has been the amazing disturbance that a, in, I would call it intense industrialized agriculture has done to our soil. Yes, no doubt. In fact, the soil don't have any problem anymore. Is it just tillage? Is tillage coupled with very little inputs? If you think about the agricultural soils, they they have basically very little inputs with crops that have only grown for a short period of time uh, in um, uh, often bred to have very little roots and um, a lot of the above ground residue. I mean, it depends now, of course, there's more and more residues returning, but in the past, a lot of the residues was removed. And so um, uh, there is no doubt that all together, the past agricultural management has brought us to the soils that we have today, which are eroded soils, are soils that cannot, um, they, they, how would I say, they are not um, resilient to climate change, they have much more imbalance between years, two years, and so forth. So we need to do something. Is 
no tilling the solution. I would say it's part of the solution and most likely every now and then it would be good to till. Uh, do you and so like it's it's never all of the way the other way and it's never just one thing. What we need to think about is the fact that for many years we have done agriculture with basically it's like if we were you know rich kids that have lived out of the richness of our parents and we never worked mm -hmm. um, and we were kept being fed with the spoon in our mouth and we got atrophic we didn't even have to move our arms to feed ourselves that's what happened to soils for centuries um, and and that's why they have their biota very eroded uh, they don't have any more uh, the organic matter is you know, I gave a speech a few years ago uh, that I said the, 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 the capital of your mind you know the organic matter is one of our capital and we have consumed it and now we better start working to build it again or you know you can be rich for a few generations but at some point even the richest uh, mm -hmm. family will get poor if nobody works in that family yeah um and so that's what we have done with agriculture we have sub we have subsidized the system and not asked it to get to work mm -hmm. and it's a great system who can work very well mm -hmm. if 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 we let it doing and that's what now we need to start thinking about but to, to make it work, the most important feeding we need to give them is plant inputs. Yeah. It, it, it's not fertilizer, it's not some chemicals. Let's have plants anytime they can be there, there, a natural system, soils are covered. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, when yeah. the climate is favorable, they photosynthesize, when they can't, they don't, but they're still there standing or at least they have residues that cover the soil. So let's design, and I, I mean, I don't want to be naive to imagining that we need to abandon agriculture and let natural system grow. I, I understand that uh, we are um, uh, so many and growing, and, and so we need to uh, be producing food, but we can produce food uh, more mindful to the system and, and also to us. And, and in the long term, I think it's going to be a win-win. Um, a situation if we do if we do it right because we can only rebuild our richness uh, by by caring about soil and again it's not just no tilling um, we are seeing all the results about what is the first thing that matter to increase soil organic matter is input mm -hmm. input is way above any other thing. And so we need to have plants there all year long. We need to have roots in the ground. We need to be mindful that often when we prioritize crop for roots, we have less above ground. Mm -hmm. And so we need to, to, to be, again, not be so short-minded to only say okay we want roots no you you want the entire plants to be there uh, mostly to fill all the niches it would be great to increase diversity in agricultural systems it would be great to have legumes that return the nitrogen because again it's not just a carbon story um and 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 we extract resources right we want food so mm -hmm. we have to be mindful on how to put those resources back in the soil so that it can be still be healthy uh, and fortunately plants can take carbon from the atmosphere and their sun beyond can take nitrogen from the atmosphere so let's have a system that through symbiosis uptake nitrogen and, and get carbon. And so we extract them, but at the same time, we have the system replenish those, those nutrients. Um, and, and, and that's where I'm saying, and everything is, is ecology. So, you know, I was talking with my son today about physics and the biggest difference is the context dependency. Yes. Uh, um, 
so we, we biology it, it's you know it's hard because it's context dependent i can't tell you what to do to be healthy what's good for you is different than what's good for me right and and so we need to study the systems and we need to to follow principles but the way in which those principles get applied in a system versus another will be different because if you're so soil is sandy, good luck forming mm -hmm. mineral associated organic matter. You don't have minerals. Right. You know, you could do something to increase sorption capacity. Maybe you can put some biochar, you can do things like that. But most, uh, in most cases, what, what would lead to uh, uh, increase uh, the health of the, the health of the soil and the soil organic butter in a, in a coarse texture soil would be different than in fine texture soils in a climate versus another in uh, you know and particularly aggregation is very important in uh, um, uh, in in, in um, yeah, I would say in warmer climate where otherwise the particular organic matter really turns over very very fast in mm -hmm. cold climate maybe might have lower level of an importance despite in a study in Canada we did see that the, the protection of, of palm in aggregates did slow down the composition significantly so um, yeah going back to tillage um, definitely you don't want to till uh, so frequently as uh, it, it conventionally uh, tilled system are um, but at the same time every now and then um, it an incorporation of the residue and aeration and, and a, a, a recycling of the aggregates uh, might also be good. We have done some lab incubation that we you know, we still have to we're in the process of publishing that, that shows that aggregated soils, actually, if those aggregates are not broken and disturbed, they won't uh, uh, they want for more aggregate around the new palm. Is you, you need at some point to allow the soil to recycle, and that's up naturally with um, with root inputs, with bioturbation, and all kind of stuff. Yeah, one of the things that I've I've observed um, in eliminating tillage from my system is that you know you once you're not creating that sort of oxygenated layer repeatedly um you know your your cover crop or what grows on the ground n natively or uh, volunteer or by seed you will eventually see a less vigorous um plant above ground you know even if you're growing roots they just it doesn't produce the same amount of biomass as a cover crop that's been you know recently cultivated because there's all that organic matter being used and so i think that what you say is is very helpful because tillage has become this um well it's like a it's like a line in the sand that people stand on either side of and it's it's really the worst yeah. thing ever or it's or it's critical to feeding the world and i think that we really do need to start getting into the subtleties of both the cropping system the baseline health of the soil that you're talking about and where you are in the world and what was there before um and I think that that's really where the conversation needs to go instead of, you know, chaining ourselves to um, one ideology or another. No, it's never it's science. It's not right. <laughs> the idea. But the, also, the, what I wanted to say, uh, in, and going back to the, you know, actually, uh, you might be familiar with Henry Johnson and, and the soil carbon yes. dilemma. Uh, we need the soil to, to turn over. Yeah. We want their we need to, use it. to turn over so that we can have the nutrients and we can maintain the, the, the health means that there are organisms in the soil that are biologically active and they are active because they can turn over that residues and stuff and so again you don't want to disturb it at all time but you do want to maintain condition that promote 
um, some turnover. And uh, so you don't want to accelerate it, but you don't want to stop it altogether because that turnover is part of the health, is part of the return of nutrients. Um, and so in particularly if we want to uh, limit mineral fertilization, uh, we can alt mm -hmm. the decomposition of the residues. Yes. And so again, I think, you know, if you are, for example, in a perennial system, um, the introduction and, and whether or not you have the ability to introduce animals to help turn, help, you know, kind of transform some of that above ground biomass and get that nutrient cycle going. Or if you don't have that capacity, are you removing the above ground portion and you know how much biomass do you have the capacity to put back into the soil i mean i think these are all these are all important questions and when you would do it that really help to sort of start to break down a a decision making framework that is as much more helpful and much more aligned with the scientific method than just saying all tillage is bad or, you know, if you don't till, yeah. then you're going to have compacted soils. It's much more complicated than that. And, and tillage also, you know, the responses to tillage actually vary um, also with climate. Yeah. So we have, I mean, don't take me wrong. We have now, we have another paper that is a meta analysis or a synthesis of different studies and many other have been shown today. And particularly in the topsoil, um, or, or actually in the very, very top, so like zero to five centimeter, uh, the, the no till accumulated organic matter. So the, the, I don't think there is discussion about that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but again, has does it, is it a religion? Right. <laughs> I don't think it should be. Right. Uh, I think it should, you know, every farmer should, uh, and, and, and one thing actually I, I learned the, the, the most from regenerative farmer is you need to observe your system and there is a point when maybe a tillage is a good thing. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Totally. And I think, you know, the, the context of the land and you know, thinking about the long term with your property and with your cropping system, directionally moving towards progress, you know, the these systems, these soil systems, these ecosystems, they have natural fluctuations over time, but a trajectory of progress, I think, is um, is what we should all be shooting for. And so it would look very different if you are growing vegetables versus a poplar plantation or a, a ranch manager. I mean, I think one of the, you know, if we do think about residue management, it's something that, you know, it's common to talk about in in ranching, um, how much gets left behind. And sometimes in like haying operations or grass seed operations. But I think that we leave it out of a lot of other cropping systems. You know, for example, you don't hear a lot of almond growers or, or vi vineyard people talking about residue management and i think that we should be thinking about those things and one of the one of the aspects of your work that i have really appreciated is that you you often will refer to soil vertebrates and and other soil organisms that aren't just the you know the ones that we're talking about so much right now bacteria and fungi but that there are there's a whole food web that really needs to come back and and so much of that turning of the soil naturally, that disturbance would have been soil vertebrates. Um, would you would you like to say anything about that? Yeah, and I don't want to set the line to my expertise, but I, I want to say that for sure um, uh, the soil food web is very important in its uh, integrity. Uh, I agree with you that the um, there's a, a, a huge focus today on uh, on bacteria and even more on fungi and mycorrhizal, and I'm very excited about that. I think they are key and and they will help us understanding more and more um, again how to manage and the, and the process of formation I think we the other thing that we did with tillage and with fertilization is to break the symbiotic relationship of roots with their mycorrhizal fungi and so I am very 
um, a strong uh, proponent of maintaining that integrity of the system, but all the way then the fungi and the bacteria are actually at the bottom of a much more complex and fascinating food web, uh, which we hardly um, understand. Um, and um, and that, for example, we haven't incorporated in models. Uh, there are a few, you know, energy flow models, food webs, but none of them are incorporated in models that we currently run in the biochemical models. And that's um, that's also part of my wish list and research. I fortunately have some uh, students that um, that are excited about them, and one in particular uh, today, my last is doing work to um, to understand the importance of um, invertebrates and, and, and other uh, soil fauna, um, in particular on pomemon formation. So yeah. again, it's it's always a system, yeah. and and you know even the microbe and the fungi they are at the bottom of the food web, uh, but their community composition, for example, might depend on predation um, and so forth. And so there there are always all this connection, and if we only focus on one thing, we lose track of the entire um, relations and as an ecologist I always try to keep again the, the linkage um, uh, in, in place. Today's episode of the No-Till Market Garden podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are designed and built in Italy where small-scale farming has been a way of life for generations. Discover the beauty of BCS on your farm with PTO-driven implements for soil working, shredding cover crops, spreading compost, mowing under fences, clearing snow, and much more, all powered by a single gear-driven machine that's tailored to the size and scale of your operation. We have been using a BCS tractor on our farm since 2014, and it has saved the day and leveled the workload more times than I can count. And I find new ways to employ it every single season. To learn more, view sale pricing, or locate your nearest dealer, visit bcsamerica.com. That's bcsamerica.com. To learn more, view sale pricing, or locate your nearest dealer, visit bcsamerica.com. That's bcsamerica.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Rimmel Greenhouses. Whether it's tomatoes to market, flowers in the spring, or your family's harvest, growing in a greenhouse protected from the weather provides the right environment that you need for a harvest that you can count on. Rimmel greenhouses are designed for durability and offer the quality that you need to grow productively year-round. Visit RimmelGreenhouses.com to get a quote today. If I may editorialize for a second, I own a Rimmel tunnel. I love it. We built it ourselves, and I really appreciated the quality of the tunnel as well as the customer service we received in the process. So make sure to check them out. All right, back to the show. So with the differentiation between the particulate organic matter and mineral associated organic matter. Let's say you ha- you do have a very coarse textured soil or, or a more sandy soil. How do you think, you know, a, a farmer in that scenario should think about managing inputs to encourage both? Because I think we, you know, I think what you what you have learned and shared with the world is that they both have a critical function. Do you think that there the ratios should be because I know one you know the there's the saturation question and then there's also you know the sort of transformation process but would you think about this differently based on this texture of your soil would you use that as a sort of um, you know starting point for your decision making tree or would you start from somewhere else I would I would start from texture and mineralogy mm-hmm uh, so the, the, for sure, you know, if you have a sandy soil that doesn't have silt and clay, um, how do you form man? You don't have the basis of the formation of man. Um, uh, but also if you have a clay soil, would some mineralogy um, uh, uh, for male differently than others and, and would there be some specificity between the chemistry of the inputs or the chemistry of the macromass and the chemistry of the minerals and, and you know you 
I'm very, very impressed by your question because you are spot on all the front line of the research today. So those are the projects that my students are working on in my labs at the moment. Um, uh, and, um, and, and so, yes, I think farmers should know their soils and the capacity for their soils to uh, form organic matter, um, uh, there is something that they can do to ameliorate that capacity if it's somewhat limited by different things. If it's uh, you know too acidic, or again, if it's too compacted, uh, if if. Um, uh, um, if if the, the there are no um, no sorption sites, maybe again biochar or 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 some sorbing agents would be uh, would be good to start. But then once they understand their capacity, that is not just the soil, but is also and and the other thing is that the soil. It's not the zero to ten or zero to twenty that most people think about. The soil is, you know, one two meters depending where you are. And the reason why we've only told on zero ten zero twenty because we crop system with no roots, right? <laughs> very, very very shallow roots, and 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 so if we start thinking about including some, um, you know, deeper rooted. Uh, crops and for there is now a lot of breeders that are thinking more to breed for roots, but also including uh, deeper rooted um, uh, cover crops or, or having some perennial phase in a rotation and things like that. So now you start thinking about uh, a deeper soils, and there are soils that have a different capacity, a different depth, and even changing texture and so forth. And so you you shouldn't just Think about your soil as your very upper layer yeah. of your soil when you assess the capacity. Um, uh, but then said that uh, also it's not just the soil, it's also the environment where you are. And so, you know, cropping system in, 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 in a cold, wet site is very different than cropping in a semi-arid environment. But then within those constraints, you can think of designing a system that optimize formation of organic matter. And maybe in, uh, and, and these are all um, working hypotheses. As I said, we are thinking about those things and we are designing experiments to try and test those hypotheses. So don't take them as my, um, uh, you know, uh, selling points. Those are starting points yeah. of research um, but yes I, I am thinking that for example promoting inputs for pump formation and aggregation in more uh, uh, coarse um, uh, textured soils might be a, a more of a winning uh, strategy to at least accrue some carbon in those soils uh, whereas in, uh, in, in clay uh, rich soils you know if you have more of the soil and and, uh, and and maybe a more legume system and so forth that doesn't um, decompose faster, but if it decompose efficiently, you can form. Um, and so th this is more or less my line of thought on which we are currently doing research. So I, I don't know if it's if it's true or not. <laughs> Well, I love I love that that's the direction that you're going because I often think that you know traditionally farmers go farmers and ranchers they get help from agronomists and um you know crop scientists and we we might start to think about the inputs of like let's say changing your soil pH or changing even the soil texture with an addition like biochar or a rock dust or something like that to try to get some mineralization sites that we should be thinking about probably that before the soil fertility to be most conducive to creating a soil environment that then is best for any crop but but you know I feel like we've really put the cart before the horse when we've thought about creating soil conditions that are just for one crop 
Yeah, and one, one way in which we we think in particular in the ecology biochemistry is thinking about plant traits, new traits, you know, and so now we, we are thinking about what are the, the input traits um, that are more conducive to form organic matter or to generate fertility and in which, uh, in, and then you need to pair that with a different source. So that's how we are kind of, uh, actually I have another student of mine who's thinking in that direction. That's interesting. I wonder, I, I, this wasn't a question that I, I thought I was going to ask, but I'm very curious um, since you, you do have the background in forest ecosystems. One of the most interesting places I, I've always felt to to see what's happening is where the forest edge meets an agricultural field and that sort of edge biology. And what do you think what do you think farmers could learn from just sort of edge ecosystem or edge biology that would potentially shift practices? Because I I imagine systems sometime in the future where we have shelter belt, you know, these big, huge fields where, you know, maybe we're going to a no-till regenerative grain rotation, but without those deep roots, um, you know, you've totally changed your soil depth and the, and the, even the rooting capacity. And I, yeah, yeah I think it would be great if, you know, we, we here in Colorado, we have more like the, the, the grasslands, um, ag, you know, the, and, and for us it's a short grass step really yes. that, uh, and so it's not that productive of an ecosystem, but still we, we used to have, we stopped with the COVID and we haven't restarted yet. We had a, um, a soil summer institute and one of the things that we used to have our students doing was to collect soil in the ag side and in the short grass, um, uh, um, pretty adjacent to, to each other. And, and so to answer your question, really dig a pit in your, in your <laughs> natural system that once upon a time used to be your ag soil and see how it looks like and you'll see roots and you'll see fauna and you'll see like again we did a, a comparison of the soil food web across an ag system and grass and it is huge mm -hmm. it's huge yeah the the food web is so eroded and and we started off looking at the effect of biochar on the on the soil food web in a cropland. There was no effect because it was hardly anything to yeah. start with. Yeah. Um, and so once we compared it to the grassland, we realized that we were really, really looking at such an eroded food web that you know. Uh, I think you can actually do more harm to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so, yeah, and the same is the roots and the deep roots. Again, dig it deep. And, 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 uh, and that turn, actually, we are thinking about that now on the other perspective that a lot of the labs, the soil testing labs, um, have conventionally treated agricultural soils which means that they have developed protocol for soils that have no roots and no gravel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now for the carbon markets and stuff, they have to process soils which have roots and gravel. And, and there is this thing that they, they don't really have the protocols to deal with that. Um, and, and so even that, even look, what you know what a, a deep rooted soil look like because then you see structure then you see the channels where the water infiltrates then you see the aggregate then you take a root out and you see all the aggregates on the root yeah. structure so these are the things that intensive tillage destroy right um and and that's the thing that no input never for right if you don't if you don't have inputs and you till that those are the two things together mm -hmm. and that's the other thing that actually this student of mine analysis showed is that the effect of tillage really matters for the single crop system yeah if you start doing regenerative system and have, you know, intent, a more diverse and continuous rotation. So if you do everything else well, you can, you know, tillage stop having a big effect. 
Right. Uh, and, and, and so that goes back to what I was saying is the entire system. And if I have to say one thing is input, 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 mm-hmm. let's not have those dark soils, yeah. you know, that you drive. And, and if it's not that short three months period, uh, it, it, it's dark soil or, you know, that's also bad for albedo and yes. let, let's cover those. So this is all energy that is lost. Yeah. It's all energy that is lost. It could be a plant there that uptake, you know, free energy. Yes. Um, and there's that, so that, much of it. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's to me is the, the most important thing is let's keep a continuous rotation as much as possible. And I know that there are systems with order and I know and I'm not an agronomist, so I don't pretend to know the solution there. But as much as we can keep that soil vegetated, uh, that that will speed everything. And then it's almost a no-brainer afterwards, in my opinion. We'll kickstart the system again. I agree. Yeah. Would you... Would you talk a little bit more about aggregation? And I think a lot of, you know, it's in it's in the conversation a lot, but especially at the practical level, I think many land managers, they know aggregation is important, but they don't really know why. And if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about the aggregation process and what what practices and what um, what what you might be thinking about in terms of how to promote aggregation and you know how that might relate to either what you're growing or what your original soil texture is. So I like that you start talking about aggregation has a process and not aggregates as an entity. <laughs> and I think that in soil science, the problem, in my opinion, has been that the measure of aggregates um, has been interpreted as a measure of different pools. Mm-hmm. And that has actually maybe we do slow down our advancement because we within an aggregate, you can have both palm and man. And, and, and so an, ag- uh, an aggregate is a, a physical state for some component of organic matter to be at some point in time in their, in their life. And so while aggregation and studying um, uh, the, the soil structure is very important, I don't think that it's helpful to say so much carbon is in macroaggregates and so much carbon is in microaggregates because they are much more heterogeneous and dynamic. Said that, I think that aggregation um, and, and I'm not a person that has started the effect of aggregation on soil function per se, but of course I read the literature and I see the soils, but you see immediately a good soil. Mm-hmm. It's a well aggregated soil, it smells differently. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, without uh, uh, being too, too naive or simplistic, uh, aggregation. Um, uh, uh, first of all, create that structure that uh, facilitate water infiltration. Um, and so it's uh, for, um, for most important in, uh, in water dynamics yeah. um, and aeration of the soil. Um, then, um, you know, there is some evidence so that uh, particular organic matter inside aggregates can decompose slower. So it's it's important in maintaining some palm. And, and you were mentioning before to saturation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, I always say there is no theoretical uh, limit to palm saturation. But then we're seeing in some study with a postdoc of mine that actually palm doesn't accumulate in, uh, in, in agricultural soils. And so we are talking about an inherent mm-hmm. limitation because it decomposes so fast and maybe promoting aggregation could somehow slow down and 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 uh, increase that palm formation. Um, 
and then um, yeah, and, so, and then there is a lot of other, uh, you know, effect on the earthworms and the soil food web and all those other um, those other evidence again. I know more from reading the literature. I am not a person that actually have studied aggregation per se because I focus more on this um, pools. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and uh, but but now like we have developed the um, a mechanistic model, and so we have been wondering whether we should represent aggregation or not um, in uh, in the model. And the problem with it's not that is we don't believe it's important, but the way of for quantifying it and mathematically representing it's important is not really straightforward and it's not um, that well documented in, in the literature. So there is much more, um, uh, how can I say? Uh, yeah, the data on aggregation are, are not too conducive to incorporate it in uh, in uh, in model um, uh, unless we start using different pools of different aggregate size fraction, which is not what I'm interested in. Yeah, it's very challenging, but it's very exciting to think about because one of the, um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to discuss with you was would be a different way of looking at regional landscapes that have historically been very agriculturally productive and a way of designing basically regional crop rotations that can actually follow process a little bit more and be a, and be more intentional about not just keeping as much inputs where they grow but also stages along the way. I mean, I loved what you were saying earlier, ta- you know, with the an- analogy of th- the the money and, and feeding ourselves, because I always use this idea of compounding interest. And until you have enough in the bank to start accruing interest, you're still burning through capital. And if we could do crop rotations that actually think about the state you know, the, the state of the soil and where we want it to go and have crop rotations that actually promote aggregation, um, we might we might be more efficient in terms of how we're rebuilding these systems. And it's funny what you're saying, because I often, I mean, funny in the sense that it, it, I use the same um, a comparison and I often have, um, you know, in, in, uh, in some audiences talk of how a man has a checking and, um, uh, and saving accounts. Um, yes. And so, first of all, the idea that you need to have a check every month, mm-hmm. like, you know, it will be very hard to manage your, uh, your your life if you only had a check three months a year. That is what the microbes get, yeah. right, For yeah. in many systems, three, four months a year. And then they need to leave for the rest. For sure, they have to use their resources, mm-hmm. their reserves. And so, first of all, the monthly salary is is critical yeah. uh, to 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 our uh, uh, um, you know to maintaining the, the 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 system. Secondly, if you put everything on saving, you can't leave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you need to go to the grocery shop and for your mind you want to go to a cinema and you want to see a friend and you want to travel and you see what I mean so yeah. uh, you need clothes so you need to spend some in order to be alive and and the, the healthier you are and the more lively and the more interaction you have maybe you need to spend a little bit more but then you need to you know how do you save you save being efficient and mindful. And so we need to have systems that integrate and so they are healthy. And 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 to me, the palm and the fast recycling, and maybe some of the mail may also exchange and recycle faster. Um that that is the 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 the, um, uh, the checking accounts. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then again, maybe aggregation to a part. I don't think that aggregation 
protects in the decadal time frame. Mm-hmm. It doesn't protect in the century time frame. Yeah. You know, and so in that regard, uh, you know, you really need to build that um, uh, strong bonding to minerals, uh, maybe have some highly recalcitrant like biochar um, to, to, to really uh, keep in the savings for, for a century uh, or, or more. Um, but that's what we want what we want to do, but always starts from the inputs. I'm glad. So we've we've touched on biochar a little bit. We've mentioned it, but I would love to give you an opportunity because it's you've you've done quite a bit of work in in not just biochar but also in fire affected um, carbon inputs. Um, would you would you be able to sort of summarize what you think? Are the are the biggest potential um, opportunities for you know th- the role of black carbon and the role of pyrolyzed carbon in sort of targeted applications as opposed to oh everybody should be using biochar because I think we've learned it's it's not always that easy um, but if you would if you wouldn't mind speaking to just you you know what you've taken away from what you've seen so first of all going back to my geeky scientist uh, aspects I love biochar carbon is like this fascinating molecule in the soil that I I think we know very little of and I love to to know more about it so I have you know I saw spot for for pyrogenic carbon black carbon biochar whatever you want to call it. i mean they are different things but um so with respect to biochar i would go back to what you said about the regional yes. uh, and and you know the connectiveness of the system and in that I would put also the socioeconomics. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wanted to say that when, you know, I, I, I thought of that when you mentioned it, that we can do, you know, whatever we uh, propose to do on the farm, it has to have a market. It has to have a consumer that want to eat their food or they want to buy their product. And so when we design those those system, it is important that there is an elevator for each of the grain that we say that should be produced in that community and things like that. So that's also to keep in mind. But yeah. when it comes to biochar, in my mind, biochar makes sense when you have a region uh, or a community that produce some organic waste uh, that is a problem or at least it's not a resource, doesn't have a place to be used. And so it can be paralyzed. And if you use without excessive transportation and without excessive consumption of greenhouse gases to harvest the residues and to transport it, you paralyze it with an efficient oven that doesn't flur uh, gases into the atmosphere and they capture the heat and maybe use it for drying or use it for warming uh, greenhouses. Or something. Yeah, and 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 so then you have uh, you know the energy use the, and then the biochar uh, can be added to the soil. And I personally believe it's beneficial. To be honest, in my experiment in in Colorado, adding char to alkaline soils in a dry system almost never moved the needle in terms of crop Mm -hmm. um, performance. Fertility performance. So I can't say that, uh, you know, yeah, you have to put biochar because your soil miraculously will grow twice as much food. I I didn't have that that experience. Uh, I could imagine that, again, in acidic or uh, coarse textured soils, it would have a different uh, a different result. Um, uh, But at the same time, it's not hurtful um it does increase carbon if you incorporate don't mm-hmm. ever put biochar on the surface and don't till it in because it will be wind blown somewhere else mm-hmm. um so the char is something that you need to at least scrape it in and incorporate into the soil um it will stay there and in my opinion would, would mostly do good or nothing Mm-hmm. Uh, at least we'll keep the, the carbon there 
for a significant period of time. I think it can help build structure, it can help build aggregation, um, uh, and and so forth. Uh, but but it makes sense only if everything we said before makes sense. Yeah. And so you don't want to import. Or coconut at um, yes. uh, you know that uh, biochar from somewhere else in the Southeast Asia that has been shipped to you. That to me doesn't really that uh, you know I'm not an expert in life cycle analysis, but uh, I, I I would be skeptical of thinking that a biochar like that would pass the test of a life cycle analysis. Uh huh. Yeah, I think you're exactly right, and I I. You know, I think about these sort of mountainous regions where we have um, we've we've had a long time of forest management that has excluded fire, and we have some sort of overproduction of carbon, and those often are directly adjacent to some of our most fertile valleys, and that there could be some real synergy in thinning efforts and redistributing carbon where it really could be yeah. very helpful. And, and again, you know, the other thing that fascinates me of regenerative agriculture is that a lot of that is really going back to the roots of a lot of indigenous and, and uh, cultures and, and practice. And fire has been, uh, you know, in a, within agricultural system since ever um and and there you know there is a reason for it yeah particularly in grasslands it does accelerate you know the the, the nitrogen uh to turn over and if it's not you know as and and having it more frequently avoid the build up of of dry biomass that then burn the soil. Yeah, the fire is really bad when it's a soil fire. Yes, and and then you burn the organic matter. What happened in the Arctic, where if you know you have that going forever in the organic layer, uh, and 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 those are really the dangerous fires that will put a lot of carbon up in the atmosphere. Yeah, but the surface fire. On a grasslands, they leave actually the live grass there and never touch the soil, but return the char to the soil. Uh, um, and they have been used for forever by yeah. the indigenous people, and and they have maintained, um, particularly savannas grassland system in uh, productive and what they are, because without the fire, a lot of grasslands would, would become woodlands, right? Yeah, I mean, a lot of their biology is very tied to that yeah. fire cycle. So, yeah, I think especially when when thinking about rangeland, um, you know, cattle operations and, and the, you know, fire is becoming more and more of a a part of our our yearly life and not in a not in a cool um, quick fire kind of a way, but in a very impactful, very devastating way. And I think, you know, if we could see our way towards a better relationship with fire and managing our landscapes more according to the their innate ecology, um, fire would be a very positive impact in a lot of systems yeah. that has been kept out of for a long time. Yeah, but now it's being portrayed also to the public opinion as this big enemy that is destroying yeah. and it's like, you know, so it's, uh, it's hard. Yeah. It's yeah. Hard. What do you, in your, in your mind, you know, if you could just do a, uh, a thought experiment where, you know, most of the really obvious constraints are removed, what would you like, what would you like your work to change in agriculture? What would, what would ideally, be a result of you know the the work that you've done and what you've learned. How could that be expressed on the land in a way that that you feel would make the biggest impacts? I'm not sure. So, how would I like to see a, a, a agricultural system running today? You yeah. Mean? What do you wish yeah. if farmers yeah. were going to I take wanna... something away? What would what what do you wish they would take away? Yeah, so I would wish them to take away, first of all, the context dependency of any solution. And there isn't one thing that will solve 
uh, of what they need to do. But um, and that's what makes farming exciting today. And actually, a lot of the younger people go back to the farm because it's more of a study process and not doing every year the same thing. And so look at your system, understand um, the potential and what hasn't worked. Um, and most likely, um, if you can find a way to intensify and diversify your crop in rotation um, uh, uh, by including um, uh, different um, uh, plant functional type and in particular the legume within the rotation so that you can also reduce uh, mineral fertilizer application uh, also by having a more diverse system and, um, and having functional type that can sustain as we were saying all the food web and, and, and possibly you know you can start doing some pest management with biological for pest management and not um, and not having to uh, to spray and again I, I I'm not necessarily like saying you have to be certified organic or you have to not you you know most likely to start off a rotation you need to put some fertilizer you can't do it see what I mean it's a yeah. process and so it's it's an end goal and maybe on the way you need to get some help somewhere mm-hmm. um uh, but but yeah think about as you were saying uh, go and visit what's the natural sites across to your friends if there is one left mm-hmm. um and think how you can manage your um, uh, you, your land so that the soil is continuously receive continuous inputs um, and, uh, and and in my opinion if you can integrate um, uh, livestock um, it's good and, and that and that brings to what you were talking about cooperative manager um, collaborative management yes. cooperation management mm-hmm. and so um, you know arrange your system in a way that there is someone that has an urge of something that can come to and 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 and, and kind of um, you know out your um, your cover crops or your perennials and um, and, and think creatively um, if you are an old farmer send your kids to a good regenerative farming school um, and and there is a lot that can be uh, that can be done uh, the the um, the nice thing is that now we can look at agriculture as solution mm-hmm. like you know how can we uh, true agriculture um, uh, um, uh, address some of the major challenges that humanity face today and so I think if I were a farmer today I would feel very um, you know excited about this opportunity and uh, I would study my system and and think away and and they know better than us again I've, I've done my career in in a lab uh, I've, I've I've collect soil cores all over the world but most of my time I've been in my office hmm. and, and a farmer knows their soils and knows their system and 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 so um, uh, yeah I, I feel it's um, and, and and come back to I am very again even if uh, I started off as a very basic scientist I feel like there is um, there is so much that we need to do together and that's actually another thing for farmer uh, we have now realized that a lot of the long-term um, experimental station have been incredibly important and powerful to drive our knowledge, uh, but their information is limited. Most often what happened in a farm operation is different than what happened in an experimental plot. Yeah. Um, and so now it's very important to do on-farm work. Uh, and so the other things I would say to farmers is, you know, come to, to the university, respond to our surveys, you know, be part of some of these studies because 
we can learn from farmers. And I think they might accelerate their transition if they work collaboratively with um, uh, with a lot of the entities that are, you know, forming today. I agree. You've been super generous with your time. And I just want to close by asking you if you have anything you would like to say um, to anybody listening about, because, you know, carbon is the word of the day and you've you've been a, a carbon um, a carbon person your you, for much of your career but would you would you like to say anything about the potential trade-offs between focusing on just soil carbon and the you know the the opportunity cost of potentially building some more durable structure and function. Do you have anything you want to close by saying about that? I, again, carbon gets together with a lot of other uh, nutrients and, 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 and thing. And so um, I personally think that there are no trade-offs of building organic matter as long as in the building process we also let some of it transform. Um, and so we, we cannot uh, think of uh, having system where the input is locked in the soil. We have to think of efficient system that locks some and let the other go. So if we let that, if we think in that way, um, then I don't see trade-offs of wanting to uh, increase carbon in uh, in soils eventually you know carbon require nitrogen to 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 stay in the soil and so we'll need to think about that nitrogen management that doesn't mean that we have to fertilize because otherwise it would be you know totally wrong from the carbon standpoint uh, with mineral fertilizer um, about again putting legumes and so forth we can do that but going back to the uh, what is wrong is what well, we have been saying all along is to just focus on one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's not the carbon per se. The carbon per se in the soil is a good thing. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's our obsession with carbon um, that it could be a wrong thing if we lose track of all the other elements of soil health and and sustainable agriculture, regenerative agriculture and so forth. Um, Is it a great thing to take carbon off the atmosphere and put it in the soil? Yes, it is. And does humanity uh, should, should do all they can to do that? Yes, they should. Should we focus our attention on that in the meantime and, and think that we are good and we don't and we don't need to um, uh, um, uh, to, 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 to get off of a fossil fuel economy. No, that's wrong. So I, I don't think that um, I, I'm despite I'm all in carbon credits, I'm very worried about um about carbon credits. I believe in carbon sequestration. I think we should that we can remove uh, uh, carbon from the atmosphere and sequester in the soil. Um, I am worried that that carbon sequestration uh, can be quantified and you in, in, with the accuracy mm-hmm. that we need to offset. Um, and so that's where I'm, I'm working hard to, to make sure because, you know, the economy will go the way they go. And if carbon markets, the only thing I can do is try to have the most accurate carbon value. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so that, you know, that's where I feel like I can do, but, um, I, I wouldn't want to be seen as a person that since I try to be accurate in quantifying carbon sequestration, I'm considered a person that is uh, in favor of offsetting existing uh, 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 atmospheric emission with estimated right. carbon sequestration, even if estimated by my lab. You see what I mean? Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I think, thank you. That's a beautiful, a beautiful way to end this. And I think food for thought for everyone who's thinking a lot about these things, not just farmers, but also people, um, people involved in policy and, and city planning and all of the things. I think we have, like, I agree with you wholeheartedly. We have very big reasons to be optimistic, but this is where I will just make a plug for, um, you know, foundational, um, education for all of our farm and future policy children to be very fluent in ecology. And I think that's what has made your work so impactful as a a, a very systems approach to what you're looking at, regardless of your background or training in it. And I I just want to thank you so much for your work and and for being with me today. It's been so great to speak with you. Thank you. It has been really a pleasure. Well, I hope if you ever make it to the West Coast that you'll um you'll let me entertain you and and pour you a glass of wine and we can take a walk and look at some things in the field that would be really wonderful i would love that yeah i'm, I'm now in uh, in naples but i'll be returning in june to the u.s and so you know it would be nice to visit you there i would love that well thank you so much again dr catrufo i i wish you the best in your uh, extended stay in italy and we'll look forward to having you back in the united states and please carry on with your very good work uh, we all appreciate it thank you well, I think you'll probably agree with me that Dr. Catrufo's uh, very charming Italian accent makes that all the more fun to listen to, but what a lot. And as soon as we were done, I had about 10 million other things <laughs> that I wanted to ask her. I think we're definitely going to be lifelong friends. And I think hopefully uh, we will all sit back for a moment and reconsider our our jobs as farmers and land managers in the context of litter management and all the cool things that we learned about today. I was out this morning in the forest and found a bunch of springtails, if you if you know springtails, little columbula, my favorites. And they were working on a bunch of oak leaves um, on the forest floor, and they were also crawling up the bark of one of the oak trees. And these are the things that, you know, you can easily miss because we, you know, we have jobs and we have too much going on. But I think that when we really think about the food webs that we're a part of and really see them and think about what we do and how it relates to the to the pieces and the and the members of our food web, it puts it all into a different perspective. So I am very grateful to Dr. Catrufo for her work and for how she translates that and for her willingness to stretch her own boundaries and and break into areas of study that draw her curiosity because I think that she's contributed a lot in a space that she didn't have a particular background in because she because she didn't have a background in it. I think that allows us to challenge some of the paradigms that need challenging. And so I got a lot out of that interview. I think um, if you're, you know, if you follow this topic at all, you've probably gotten so much out of some of Natalie's interviews. And if you haven't checked it out, I, I highly recommend her um, her series, uh, Priming for Production, um, which is just excellent. So anyway, from the, from the soil, <laughs> signing off and really grateful to my friends at the No-Till Growers um, who make this all possible and to the other hosts and guests. It's just a great ecosystem to be a part of, and I'm feeling a lot of gratitude today. The sun is also shining, which helps a lot. All right. See you guys later. Hey, you all. Farmer Jesse here just jumping in real quick to catch you up on some of what we have going on first. Hannah and I are hosting a couple small farm events here at Rough Draft Farmstead, like coming right up, one on April 25th, 2023, and the other on May 9th, 2023. There will be hands-on demos and a farm tour, and we'll dive into some of our growing systems. Uh, We will put a link in the show notes. The details are at roughdraftfarmstead.com or at the notillgrowers.com forum as well. I will also be presenting with Dan Kittredge in North Dakota at Minokin Farm for the Burley County Soil Conservation District. No idea if I pronounced any of that right, but my presentation will be on regenerative practices on a small scale. That is on May 2nd. 
2023. So all the details for that will be linked in the show notes as well. Also, we asked you all a few weeks back to do a survey, and you absolutely killed it. Uh, But we have one more much smaller survey that we would love for you to complete about no-till growers specifically. Uh, Link to that in the show notes. That is very helpful for our work. Oh, and uh, if you haven't already, check out the No-Till Growers YouTube channel. That thing is back up and jamming again for another season with lots of very good guides and informative videos for everything from onion, tomato, pepper, and spinach production Uh, to demystifying the tomato crafting process and simplifying compost production, all sorts of good stuff. Go over to YouTube and search for No-Till Growers and subscribe. If you loved this podcast episode and would like to support our work, you can pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook at notillgrowers.com or one of the No-Till Hats, which are back in stock. We've got merch there as well. The proceeds from those sales at notillgrowers.com go to supporting our work, which is free and open to the public. If it has benefited you and you have the means to pitch in, that would be super rad. Or even better, become a yearly or monthly patron at patreon.com slash notillgrowers, where not only may you get discounts on our stuff, but at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs this week to Closer Farm and Livestock Co., Sean at All About the Garden, Bill Altman, Ian at Grindstone Farms, Stephen Smith and Ohio Roots. Huge shout out to everyone who supports our work in whatever way that you can. The Patreon page is the lifeblood of our work, so we hope you will hop on board. And that's it for me. Thanks, y'all. We'll see you next week. Bye.